we are live. Thank you, Mariana. So I think that we can start. Thank you all for uh, joining um, our webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Nicolas Panagiotou. I am uh, president of Digital Communication Network uh, Global, which is supported from World Learning and uh, State Department Educational Exchanges Office, whom we thank. We are organizing this webinar that it is part of our inaugural event that it will take place in Australia. Digital Communication Network Global, it is a global network with uh, over than 10,000 members. We have uh, we are creating chapters all across the world. Uh, the last one we have created was the chapter in Americas. And uh, between uh, October 16 to 18, we have the inaugural event regarding the chapter that we will launch in East Asia and the Pacific. Uh, and it will take place in Sydney in Australia. The, um, uh, our uh, inaugural event, it is titled Information Integrity in the Digital Age. It is a hybrid inaugural event and we, we actually invite you to register, to join us virtually through this uh, QR code. It is going to be a major event that uh, where were all the things related with uh, elements of the information integrity, the digital age, and more and more importantly, how we we should approach public communication as a public good. Also, actually, how to discuss and address uh, critical challenges that we face will be at the center of this event. This event also will feature a lot of technological advance, advancements, and more specifically, we will work a lot regarding the issue of uh, metaverse, where all participants will have the opportunity to experience metaverse and actually to experience uh, the realm of uh, digital uh, technologies. But beyond digital technologies, it is a major chance and opportunity to meet our network, to understand our uh, organization and the work that we are doing. So please join us in uh, this event. Today's event, it is titled um, Climate Change and Disinformation. It is actually inspired of a major and a critical challenge that uh, as a global communion, community we are uh, facing and uh, around a very specific and important issue that it is related with, um, with the need to communicate science and to communicate um, uh, scientific data in a specific way. The, to, together with us are our uh, distinguished speakers to whom I would like to pass the floor in order to introduce themselves. And immediately after, we will start firstly from Purple and then uh, followed by Luke and then uh, from uh, uh, Ju. Uh, Purple, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Happy to see you all up, uh, here. Uh, I'm Proctor Romero. I'm supervising editor from Anila, which is a fact-checking initiative at the University of Hong Kong. And I primarily uh, do research about different narratives plant misinformation in mainland China, Hong Kong, and some parts of uh, Taipei. So thanks for having me here. Thank you. Luke? Hi, everybody. My name is Luke Bacon. I am the Associate Director for Impact, for sorry, Research, Learning and Impact at Purpose. Um, Purpose is a global social impact agency doing communications across a range of social issues all over the world. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my, my presentation today, but um, my work and my work before joining Purpose is all about how communications and campaigns teams and policy experts and people like that can actually put research into action um, and actually use the insights to do something in their work. Um, yeah, thanks. Luke. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Ju. I so glad to be part of this event. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. My name is Ju Chong Tam. I'm a professor at the law school at Melbourne University. Um, my research expertise is um, um, firstly in the area of public law, focusing on law and democracy, and uh, also in, in labor law. I'm also an um, elected trade union official, so I'm a uh, Victorian Assistant Secretary for the National Tertiary Education Union. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now let's start with the uh, presentations. Purple, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, now let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Uh, hope you can see my slides. Yes, yes. All right. So, hi again. Um, I would like to start my presentation with this bold um, proclamation. I'll say the title of an article from Foreign Policy. Um, it was published in 2017 and it says that there was the convenient disappearance of climate change in China, but it happened supposedly in 2012. So what kind of climate skepticism can we actually see back then? What, what um, narratives disappeared allegedly in 2012? Now, in, from 2008 to 2011, the climate skepticism was being perpetuated by uh, some prominent actors in mainland China, such as Larry Lang Xinping. Uh, he's a famous uh, TV show host where he said that actually climate change is just you know, a myth uh, manufactured by the Western countries. And this kind of narrative has also been uh, spread in books. So please note that these are being perpetuated by, again, a popular TV host using the medium of television and then via published books way back from 2008 to 2011. Now, these books are also saying that climate change is actually something that was conjured by Western countries so they can earn from developing green technology. But in 2012, it disappeared, quote unquote, because by then, the CPC or the Communist Party of China, the leadership, has already started seeing um, into climate change as an area that is very important for their governance, something that they have to tackle really head on. Also because that according to a survey then, that actually 93% of uh, the citizens in mainland China believe that climate change is real. Okay, so although remarkably only 55% according to the cell survey also believe that um, it's actually not man-made. So uh, going forward, 2008, 2011, these are the narratives, they disappeared in 2012. I wouldn't really say that they completely disappeared. If we look at the medium where they're spreading the misinformation, because if you look at China, China has its own architecture of social media platforms. We have WeChat, Miku, Bilibili, uh, Douyin, Xiaong Shu, so on and so forth. And some of them, I took a screenshot of the uh, right side of my slide. Now, the climate skepticism, different types of climate misinformation spread via the social media platforms from 2012 onwards. And this is what we try to capture in our report. So now here are the narratives which have emerged from that report. And interestingly, this is how the narratives have evolved. Now, mainland China actually embraces the fact that climate change is real, okay? So much so that they believe it's beneficial to them. Okay, now here, this is actually written in Mandarin, but I translated for everyone. Uh, in one of the articles which spread in 2021, uh, it said that global warming is no benefit to other countries, particularly European countries, because, you know, of good weather, supposedly. But those in the north, like ours, mainland China, which are arid and rainless, global warming could actually be good. And like, consequently, the article said, climate change. And why is that? Why do they think that is actually something that's beneficial to mainland China? It's because of this. Okay, the person here uh, in the photo is Zhu Kajen. Zhu Kajen. Sorry if I mispronounce it a bit. Um, but he's a pioneer in meteorology in mainland China. And he had a study before which said that actually, if you're going to look at the purest prosperity in mainland China, speaking of dynasties, the dynasties were rich during the times when there was warm temperature. So they sort of linked having high temperature, warm temperature to being prosperous. Second photo, suddenly we have elephants. Okay, so what do these elephants have to do with that belief? They're saying that the fact that there were 15 wild Asian elephants who were which were seen going eastward is a sign that actually that means that they're heading is uh, northward because there will be warmer temperature then. And again, that only means that uh, in terms of vegetation, in terms of um, having uh, more uh, better farming prospects, uh, global warming can help actually in, uh, increase and improve those prospects. 
And last but not the least, we can see here, this is a study from the Institute of Geology and Geophysics, the Chinese Academy of Sciences, that global warming will shift the East Asian monsoon rate Gulf northward. So no, all of this combines just basically saying that um, global warming will mean higher temperature, will, will, will mean the moving or the shift of the East Asian monsoon rate, Gulf Norwood, which means more rain in that area, which means more vegetation, which means better farming, better produce, more money. Okay, so, so that's why they believe actually it's not a bad thing. We should welcome it. Okay, but this has been debunked by their own scientists, the Chinese scientists. Okay, they're saying that. Yes, it may in, improve and increase precipitation in that part, but then the effects will vary. So the disruption of water cycle will actually is exacerbate droughts in parts of like Ningxia, Shanxi, and Gangsu. Well, of course, other parts may ex well, could experience like massive rainfall. So it's not because like you will have climate change that the effects will be like the same for every part of mainland China. So this is how their own scientists and researchers and experts uh, debunk this um, belief or this, this misinformation. So, but that's just one narrative. And this is just coming from the social media platforms and own uh, architecture uh, online and infrastructure in mainland China. Because actually, another narrative came from something that's beyond the Great Firewall. And that's from Twitter, now called X. Okay, so this one, as we all know, this is like Greta Thunberg. And this, uh, her picture of being manipulated and trying to show her as gaining weight has been done repeatedly. It's what we call a zombie claim. And why do they do that? Like, why do they do this to Greta Thunberg? It's because um, this particular claim is something that's sort of backed by the state. So. It all happened um, way back in 2021 when Greta Thunberg tweeted that, you know, China is still categorized as a developing country. But having said that, if they don't really um, limit their emissions, then, you know, they're not really contributing to the reduction or addressing really the, the problem of climate change effectively. And that um, earth, earth and, well, I got the, you know, attention of the, editor of China Daily um, who tweeted and replied to her tweet and said that you got it all wrong. Um, why are you blaming mainland China when it, historically speaking is the Western countries which really have the highest you know, emissions, carbon emissions. So because of that, um, there's the hostility there. Uh, Global Times, which is state media, also sort of like they publish an article uh, that's attacking also Greta Thunberg. And then after that, you can see social media platforms in mainland China saying that, well, one, posting this photo. It's very um, ad hominem, as you can see. And then another um, misinformation, well, about her is that supposedly Greta Thunberg said that uh, Chinese people should stop using chopsticks because they keep on cutting down trees, which isn't actually good to the environment. But that quote isn't really real. And that's been debunked already numerous times. But having said that, if you can just take a look again, most likely you will see the same claims against Greta Thunberg. And, and, because, and it's because, again, she really angered you know, the top echelon, I would say, important people in mainland China. Okay. And now this is something that is, again, spread, that, spread beyond um, the Great Firewall of mainland China. So you can even see it on Twitter. Okay, now here from Twitter, again, but this is a different narrative because if we go back, remember in my previous slide, I said that um, the books that were published from 2008-2011, uh, they said that climate change is just something that Western nations conjured so that when they, when they develop green technology, they can profit from it. Uh, now it's actually also being used against mainland China because China, as we all know, is now one of the or the top manufacturer of EV, and it's uh, it's now being used against them. So this video, um, for one, supposedly showed an EV in China which just um exploded 
but it's not. It's actually a CNG car made by Chevrolet in Uzbekistan. And this, so this has been, again, debunked. But the other one here, the windmill, this is very difficult to debunk. And this is where I will say, um, or I will raise the limitation in fact-checking some of the misinformation about climate change or climate issues in mainland China. Because this also showed a video supposedly showing a windmill which collapsed, but we couldn't geolocate if it's really in China and if it's really manufactured by China. Uh, now, why would, now, you may ask, why would a Chinese tweet um, you know, try to say something bad about mainland China? Well, now it shows like, the polarization of uh, even within mainland China. And, you know, like there are some groups, you know, Chinese groups, which are against also CPC. And while we cannot really like 100% say that, oh, that group may have been behind this, uh, I think it's an important inference to take note because Twitter has actually been used, again, by some uh, groups that are against CPC or mainland China uh, to attack them. And so now, but why is this narrative believable? Because um, there's this belief that anything manufactured from China has really substandard quality. We have what we call their afrosology or a phase where say tofu project. When you say it's tofu project, it's really substandard, it's mediocre, it's something that can just easily be destroyed or damaged. And that's how they describe products from mainland China. And those products include supposedly China's EV and China's windmills and other products uh, that could reduce carbon emissions. DAR is a technology basically. Okay, so now this one, another platform. So from the grid, uh, from the social media platforms from mainland China, beyond the firewall, Twitter, and now we have here the Epoch Times, which we can say was, is run by and published or supposedly linked to Falun Gong. And Falun Gong is a group persecuted uh, by the CPC, Communist Party of China, um, because of their uh, spiritual beliefs. And they have been described as a cult. And um, Epoch Times has been linked again um, to Falun Gong. And this uh, article here, which they've published, said that uh, 1,100 scientists, uh, climate scientists, supposedly like sent a declaration saying there's no climate emergency. But we also tried to look into those. So we tried to track down all those signatories and we found out that we helped, not just, not just us, but also fact checkers from uh, Taiwan. Uh, we found out that only 10 were climate scientists, but they still signed. But basically like, you know, 1,110 like, vast difference. Okay, so I hope we're able to see how uh, misinformation time in China has evolved in narratives also based on where they're being spread because the platforms also matter here and of course who spreads them. Okay, so that's all from my end. Um, I hope I didn't go beyond the time allotted for me and if you have any questions, you. we're then happy to answer them. Thank, Thank you, you. Perfect. It was very insightful and I think that uh, having uh, very specific examples, it will um, uh, contribute to the discussion uh, that it will follow later. What I suggest, we will move on with the presentation of all speakers, and then we can go um, in uh, in the question session. Thank you, Purple. Luke? I'm just um, sharing my screen. Hey, give me a, a thumbs up if you can see the screen. Somebody? Yes, yes. Yes, microphone. Yes. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm Luke Bacon. Um, I work at a company called Purpose, um, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about, but I'm filling in for Jenny King um, today, who's the, the head of climate um, disinformation research and other research at the Institute for Strategic Dialogues. And Jenny is a much, much bigger expert than I am. And... Um, I've learned a lot from her working with her on a few different projects over the years. So it's a, a real um, uh, honor and to, to step in for Jenny and kind of big shoes to fill. But I just wanted to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you today from unceded Wangal land um, in what's known as Sydney in Australia. Um, and uh, in Australia, we acknowledge the land that we're on, um, the First Nations people whose land it is 
um, to acknowledge uh, the history of co co colonialization here and the impact that's had. But I think very importantly in this kind of a context where we're talking about disinformation, um, First Nations people in Australia have been fighting disinformation for hundreds of years. Um, when they first, uh, when uh, white settlers first arrived, they used this myth of terra nullius, a British legal doctrine that meant there's no one here, um, which was absolutely false and disinformation and, and used that as part of their dispossession of the land. And it's been, um, you know, connected to massive ecological damage. So we, we acknowledge a respect to elders um, past and present, but also to acknowledge the limits of our own knowledge and the importance of listening to First Nations people. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to um, walk through a bit of an example of, I'm going to tell you a little bit about purpose, and then I want to give you a quick look at an Australian example. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm based in Sydney in Australia. Um, purpose is a global organisation, but within the ASEAN region or the Asia Pacific, um, Australia is an interesting example because it's a kind of Western country in, in Asia um, it's the world's largest exporter of coal and uh, increasingly um, uh, gas or um, methane gas. So it's it's a really significant climate change country, um, but also don't want to overstate its, its global um, significance either. But it's interesting in our region. So I want to give you a case study of a specific act that we've been looking at. And then I want to give you a little bit of a taste of a framework we've been working on that helps communications professionals or any kinds of teams working with misinformation. So just to jump in for starters, who is Purpose? So Purpose is a global social impact agency. Um, we do communications, but a lot of our work is all about finding who's, who do audiences actually trust, specific audiences, and working with those people. So just to give you a, a flavor of some of the different projects that um, we do globally, on the left here, is our project Verified, which is a, a really big scale project for the UN um, that was developed through COVID. And that's all about getting out really good um, information about public health issues um, through local doctors or musicians or all kinds of different people at local areas in um, well over hundred countries around the world. Um, this one in the middle, I did something very different. This is a project that our team in Indonesia, this is one of my favorite projects our team in Indonesia um, work on, which is called the Islamic Climate Movement, which is working with different Islamic organizations to build an um, Islamic climate movement in Indonesia. And it involves digital campaigning, but also organizing. And this was an event with um, Indonesia's vice president. And then over here, something completely different again, is the Purpose Gamer Lab, which is um, the, uh, so the Game Impact Lab, which is a project of our Brazilian office that works with gamer influencers, so streamers and other, other types of gamers um, to, to provide good information and counter kind of extremism and um, particularly kind of violent extremism ideology in gamer spaces. So really different kinds of projects. Um, my work is specifically been about disinformation and hate speech. And I've worked on projects um, with teams around the world. Um, and as I said in my kind of introduction, I'm really interested in doing the research, finding out um, those really important practical details, but then really getting them to teams in meaningful ways so that they can do something with them and, and counter this stuff. So I just wanted to kind of, you know, throwing to Jenny, who I'm filling in for, um, this was a quote that Jenny gave to the New York Times in an article that came out a few days ago. And basically what the, she's talking about here and what the article is talking about is a bit of a shift from traditionally we've seen climate disinformation coming from big money fossil fuel um, companies, greenwashing, stuff like that over decades. But something's going on in the last few years where a more kind of old school almost or a new form of climate denial is emerging um, that's much more aligned with conspiracy theorists and extremist far-right actors um, in a very decentralized way. Um, and Jenny uh, kind of points out here that this is this kind of marriage of convenience where fossil fuel interests have kind of made this signal over decades, and now it's getting picked up in a kind of unpredictable way uh, and a really interesting way that we need to stay on top of. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about one Australian um, actor who are kind of in this space, and they're a bit of a unusual example um, and they play this kind of bridging role between different kinds of institutions and cultures that I think um, we'll find interesting. 
So this group is called Advance. They're, they used to be called Advance Australia, um, but now they're just called Advance, but I still call them Advance Australia. Um, they're a, a kind of fairly, um, there's not a lot known about Advance or how they kind of actually, what they're made up of, how many staff they have or anything like that. Um, but they're a campaigning group that's been around for a few years now. Um, and they, they're, a, they're kind of a civil society organization or an NGO, but they're, they're actually legally a private company and we don't know if they have any staff really. It's kind of a bit of a, a um, mysterious situation in a way. But um, Advance has been around for a few years now. And what they do is they integrate climate denial and climate disinformation. Is, it's kind of their main, um, has been their main modus operandi for the last four years. Um, but they integrate that into a bigger kind of far right um, positioning. They um, have very strong um, transphobic or anti-transgender campaigning. They're um, very militaristic and, um, and I would say kind of amplifying xenophobia. Um, and overall, they're very, very against um, green policy. Recently, they've um, been taking a very strong position with a referendum that's happening in Australia this year, which is like the biggest political event in Australia this year. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But they're interesting because they, they're presenting stuff that we would think of as very fringe, but they also have very strong links to Australia's Liberal Party, which, is, which had you know, controlled the government of Australia for most of the last 20 years. Um, they have a lot of money, but their funding is largely unknown. But they do, we do know they get some big investments from um, big donations from investment uh, banker in one case. Um, and then interestingly, they had this close link to a, a kind of Christian fundamentalist, I would say, digital campaigning company called Whitestone Strategic, who work um, across a range of kind of uh, right-wing Christian organizations in Australia, but also have links to the Christian right in America. So just to give you an example of advances kind of scale, in for their referendum campaign, which is to get people to vote no in Australia's upcoming referendum, um, so far, and there's still a bit of time to go, they've spent almost half a million Australian dollars on Facebook ads, Facebook and Instagram ads alone and have had these seen um, more than 40 million times. So it's a lot of money going out there and they've put out over 700 ads. Interestingly, um, this, is, this is some examples of their ads. Now, what I think is a really interesting tactic that we should be aware of uh, from a group like this, and I, I expect we, you know, probably this has already happened in lots of places, but I would say um, we, we should expect to see more of this. Advance actually operate four, of operating four different brands um, during this referendum campaign that they're running Facebook ads across these different brands. One is their own brand, Advance Australia. They have another one called Fair Australia that, you know, is running similar ads, but with a different branding that's trying to present it as it's kind of a First Nations led campaign. Um, whereas the Advance Australia one is much more nationalistic. They have another um, brand and page called Referendum News that tries to create confusion by kind of presenting articles or news articles about the referendum and just they're saying, we're just presenting you know, unbiased news. Um, but they do it in a way that is really meant to kind of escalate people's fear and create division. And then really interestingly, they also have a campaign that's completely counter to everything else they're presenting, um, saying, no, this referendum's not enough. That's trying to... That, tries to kind of mimic a left-wing perspective, no to the referendum. Um, so you can see it's, it's very confusing for people. I think it's very disingenuous the way they operate. Um, and it's, you know, it's a lot of money and it's, it's very sophisticated in their kind of branding and the way they operate. So in the climate change space, this was a campaign, um, as I said, climate denial is their main, um, main game. And this is a campaign Advance started last year and they've been running this year and have put tens of thousands of dollars into um, this campaign. This campaign is called Not Zero, which is a play on the climate policy net zero. Um, and the idea is that the, the cost of, of this is not zero. And they're trying to say to people, um, you know, to kind of ordinary, quote unquote, ordinary people that you're going to pay for all these climate change policies. Um, and in, in particular, this campaign is about linking cost of living rises and the kind of unstable economy that we're living through um, with emissions reduction policies. I might come back to this if we have time. 
So at Purpose, and, and particularly in relation to when we saw that campaign for the first time last year, um, we see this, we've worked you know, with climate research groups like ISD and, and many others, and we work with all kinds of other institutions and stakeholders. Uh, and we really see this issue where really important research that's being done by groups isn't getting quickly enough into the hands of stakeholders in a way where they can really use it to create change or effectively respond to these um, climate disinformation campaigns. So there's this important opportunity here to link research and action, I would say. And I'm going to quickly show you a framework we've been working on um, that you know I can send a link if people want to hear more about it as well. So this is this framework that we call the response model. It looks like there's a lot going on here. And it is, this is an expert tool that we use in workshops. Um, and we use, you know, as a team ourselves, but we share with partners. And it's a way to firstly um, assess, building on actually uh, a threat matrix that we that we took from um, GQR, an American organization, when they in turn built on a um, uh, what's called the breakout scale by Ben Nemo. But we we kind of iterated it a little bit in a different direction. Um, and we use this tool both to firstly assess threats. So not all disinformation threats are the same. We need to prioritize and understand what kind of threat they are. And then we use this to guide us towards different forms of action. And this model has five different types of action that we um, we point to. So it's not just always fact checking and a key a key element of this model is we're trying to dis dissuade people or get them to kind of slow down a little bit on the fact checking. Um, but we we present kind of five different strategic responses people can take. So getting better prepared, trying to prevent further reach of this material, delegitimizing the threat for key audiences, inoculating key audiences, which is a certain style of campaign, um, and strengthening allied responses. So very, very core to Purpose's perspective, and I think, you know, all of ours is that one organization's communications are not enough. We actually need lots of different kinds of organizations and stakeholders working together, providing different kinds of materials to really counter this stuff effectively. And so what this threat, what this um, response model does is for each, once you've assessed a threat and you've said this is, this is a high reach threat that is of medium risk, it then gives you, um, it recommends what kinds of strategic actions might suit that kind of um, that kind of a threat. It gives you a bit of a starting point for thinking through your response. We're not overly prescriptive in terms of saying like, do this specific thing or call these specific people or something like that. Different organizations or actors have different resources and relationships and different positions. And, um, and we think this is all about um, activating their their actual expertise and experience about what they know to combat this stuff rather than just telling people what to do. And we found this helpful for five reasons. So it reduces ambiguity. There's a lot of um, a lot of different ways of talking about this stuff and it helps teams and partners come to a common language. It provides a starting point. So it gives you a sense of here's a kind of thing that we could do. And we have a lot of materials that give examples. It counters that instinct to just always correct and get out there, which can really backfire. Um, again, it's bridging that research and the campaigns action, so trying to bring teams together. And it's all about helping people um, allocate resources effectively because a lot of the organizations like ourselves and others who are fighting this stuff only have limited resources and they need to be used in really careful ways. So this is all about uh, prioritizing our, our responses. Um, that's yeah, that's the kind of model again. We've actually got a blog post up that we just put up the other day that explains this in a bit more detail that I'll, I'll give you the link to. Um, it kind of it looks quite complex when you look at it first, but once you've kind of been through the training, it, it helps a lot. Um, but yeah, thanks. I hope that kind of gives you a little bit of an insight into one of the kinds of groups that we're looking at in Australia and how we're, we're thinking about responses. Um, if there's time later, maybe I'll, I'll take you through a little bit of our response um, intervention to, to that Advance Australia Not Zero campaign. But yeah, thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, it was a very interesting and very insightful as well presentation. And I think that it aligns very well with uh, Purple's presentation. Um, I will move now to the next uh, speaker, uh, Ju. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. Thumbs up if that worked. 
Yeah. Good. Yes. Right. Okay. Excellent. Great. Um, now, as we, as we all probably know, um, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has uh, said that you know climate change is an existential crisis. We have a report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change saying that in terms of a climate safe uh, world, we need unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society. And the question that comes to mind as a really a person who studies democracy is whether democracy can effectively address climate change. Or is it, as um, you know, one commentator said, is it the planet's worst enemy? So what we have really when we think about climate, the climate crisis is that it's at once also a crisis for democracy. And you see this very clearly in terms of this quote by Christiana Figueres, who was basically the chief UN negotiator for the Paris Agreement and her then chief of staff, Ton River Carnet. If democracy to survive and thrive in the 21st century, climate change is one big test that it cannot fail. Now, when we think about the crisis, and I'm here quite influenced by the thinking of Jared Diamond, there really is, sorry, I can't seem to, oh, here you go. It's a Janus face uh, phenomenon. Um, I think mean the, the face that we often focus on is the face of extreme danger, of extreme risk, but at the same time, it's also a time of profound opportunity. And it's really to sort of grasp this Janus phase aspect of the crisis, both in terms of climate, in terms of democracy, that um, international idea, so international the Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, intergovernmental organization based in Stockholm, uh, commissioned me to sort of lead this report on looking at climate change and democracy with a particular focus on the Asian Pacific. And I'm really um, looking forward to learning from uh, this uh, audience uh, that we have today of experts that are based in the Asia and the Pacific. So what I'm gonna do in the uh, uh, this time I have, this 10 minutes, is really kind of situate this theme about climate change and disinformation. Firstly, in the context of the findings uh, of this report, um, particularly its findings in relation to democratic debilitation. And then I'm going to perhaps somewhat provocatively talk or what I uh, speak about, perhaps what I refer to as the big lie. So quickly on the report, uh, at 10 uh, case study countries, you have them up on the slide. Uh, we basically chose them for, us, uh, for the purpose of diversity, but with a particular emphasis on climate vulnerability. And you'll see that in that particular table that there are four Pacific Island countries, uh, uh, Fiji, uh, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu. And these case studies were written by experts based in these particular countries. Um, I wrote the one on Australia and also sort of wrote the, both the introductory and conclusion chapter for this particular report and basically sought to frame the case studies along uh, uh, according to particular questions. And one particular set of questions was basically asking the case study writers reflecting upon their particular countries to consider what are said to be the circumstances of democratic debilitation. So what I mean here are basically dynamics within democratic systems that are said to hinder effective climate action. So there are four, you can cluster them according to four. There's short-termism. Uh, we all know, of course, the climate challenge is something uh, where you know cause and effect uh, are separated out by uh, uh, significant temporal skills, and the criticism here about democracy that it, by running according to periodic elections, where voters vote according to the agendas for the next two or three years or four years, um, they are unable to deal with the long-term challenge of climate change. Now, the second, and Luke mentioned this, is captured by vested interests. And um, uh, Luke mentioned, referred to the fossil fuel interests and David Attenborough has said that, you know, vested in his words, vested interests are the most formidable obstacle in terms of clean energy future. Then the self-referring decision-making. So what we're thinking about here is that what we do know about the climate is a global challenge, but what we do know about in terms of environmental challenge is how uh, our lives are interdependent uh, that interdependence um, is one that basically transcends national boundaries. Um, 
And it's also interdependence, not just in terms of human communities, but also inter interdependence between humanity and nature. Whereas the criticism here in terms of democratic debilitation is that when you have the main mechanism for democracy being elections, voters, that is a particular section of the present generation making decisions about its interests, that interdependence between different national communities uh, is occluded. So is inter interdependence in terms of intergenerational relationships, and of course, interdependence between humanity and nature. And weak multilateralism, yeah, in terms of uh, dealing with a global challenge, but basically uh, decision-making, de democracy being based on in nation states. Now, how does this, what I want to say here, and I suppose I'll do it in terms of the next, next slide, is really connect with the theme of this particular seminar. So here we're not, I think when we think about disinformation, of course, we're looking at disinformation in terms of discrete pieces of information, right? So some, somebody saying that, you know, in fact, there's no global warning, right? Or even if it's global warning, uh, it has positive impacts. So particular discrete pieces of information. I suppose what I'm trying to do here in terms of situating within democratic debilitation is look at the broader context. And in fact, Luke sort of referred to this in terms of firstly, the sources of this information. And also, if you like, certain frameworks of thinking that basically have this information encoded. So let me draw just salient points in terms of this table. I won't go through the whole table. It's got a, a, a rich many of findings, some less relevant to the theme of uh, today's seminar, but a damaging role of commercial interests. Yeah. Uh, now this was perhaps the main finding in terms of the 10 countries, in terms of a source of democratic debilitation. We saw it in terms of specific industries and in Australia, uh, we have this, uh, you know, under uh, previous governments, we had this self start label where uh, fossil fuel lobbyists will call themselves the greenhouse, liken themselves to organized crime by calling themselves the greenhouse mafia. Uh, you see this too in terms of the coal industry in India um, and in the Somalia, Somalia Islands, but you see it also in a broader sense, not just in terms of the role of commercial interests sort of distorting, distorting policy making, is this general sense that the development of country requires a strong politics uh, business nexus. We saw this in Japan, we've seen it in Singapore in terms of its sort of uh, push towards development, and we see it in terms of Indonesia, perhaps in a more egregious way, in terms of what people talk about the organization of politics. Now, this feeds into short-termism. So the, what we found with the short-termism is that it's not doesn't stem from what is said to be the usual criticism about regular elections, but it's really because Commercial interests have such a distortionary uh, impact in terms of policy making and opinion that the national interest then becomes equated to their particular interests. And it's often equated to their particular short term interests. So it's short termism, if you like, of a corporatized kind. Happy to talk about the other other findings at the time, but let me let me move on to the other part, uh, and also happy to talk about the recommendations of the report. There's a fair bit of detail there, but let me move on to the other part uh, of my presentation, a big lie. So we think about disinformation. Disinformation is information that misleads, information that is false. So what is a big lie that in fact, for a lot of us, yeah, is invisible. And here, I think we got the great authority of Pope Francis. Yeah. And it's the lie of continuous economic growth. Yeah. And that's based, you know, uh, what Fra uh, Pope Francis says, that is an infinite supply to us good. And this leads to the planet being squeezed dry at every limit. Now, let's put this perhaps in um, probably less provocative terms. Why is this a falsehood or lie, right? So what I'm sure all of you would agree with is that, and this has been popularized in terms of science, there are planetary boundaries, yeah? Um, some of which have been already exceeded. So when we think about the earth as ecology, sorry, <clears throat> the earth as ecology is a closed system. But the assumption of continuous economic growth basically is premised upon the economy as an open system, yeah? So at some point, 
And in fact, now it collides. Yeah, it collides. And that's why when we, uh, the, the Secretary of the UN Framework on Conventional Climate Change, in fact, has said that a growth-oriented economy may not, in its words, and you see that on the slide, may not be compatible with a climate-safe economy. And that's why there's this growing chorus uh, 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 advocating for post-growth economies or degrowth economies. But here's the big challenge. The big challenge is that if we're envisaging the end of continuous economic growth, then we're really envisioning the end of capitalism. Because, and this is the air we breathe, right? Intrinsic to capitalist economies is accumulation and growth. Yeah? That is, in fact, you know, what people laud to be sort of a, a driving dynamic, a source of innovation, a source of welfare and prosperity. However, and you see that up in slide in terms of um, uh, a quote from David Harvey, that a zero growth economy is a logical and exclusionary con uh, economy is a logical and exclusionary contradiction with capitalism. It simply cannot exist. All right, that's it for me. And um, look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you, Ju. I would uh, like to ask you if you can elaborate uh... A few things about the recommendations of the report. I think that uh, it can serve as a basis actually to move on uh, our discussion, but also I will open the floor to the audience if they have any questions before I start our questions. Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll bring up a, um, if you give me a few moments, um, uh, I'll, I'll give, uh, Nicholas, I'll, I'll just I'll yes. bring up a yes, slide yes. that has, has basically the, um, the recommendations. Yeah. You, you were all uh, great ones in uh, keeping the time limit. So my job as a moderator was really easy. <laughs> I would actually like to emphasize us, uh, Ju is trying to uh, uh, share with us the results of uh, the report that um, as you can understand from all uh, from all the presentation from distinguished speakers, it is that uh, uh, we share a common, let's say, approach that we view this information as a social phenomenon, rather than um, rather than actually and look just posted about the response model, which fits very well, and uh, rather than a technical approach that it, it can be solved through developing technological tools. By saying that, we don't underestimate the importance of having the available this kind of tools. But I think that what it is important, it is as um, actually resulted both from Luke and Purple as uh, from Jew, um, um, uh, presentation, it is important to have a responses model that will actually exploit all uh, and it will build upon our understanding because this is where it lies, the power of disinformation. It lies upon the power of social media to spread it, but most importantly, it lies upon the power of the people actually to believe it. And this is what it is more intriguing and uh, intriguing to all organizations that are working around that, uh, that topic. As we wait for you, I would like actually to open up the floor if you have any questions, but I would like actually to to start uh, the discussion by with the following question. How, how has the spread of disinformation impacted public perception of uh, climate change? Uh, and um, I would, uh, Luke, do you want to go for it? Yeah, I can. Um, I think that's a really good question. And I think, um, uh, you know, in, in um, Ju Chiang's um, presentation, I think David Harvey would really approve of us talking about the relationship between technology and society and culture and what people think, you know, this is about all of those things together. Um, you know, in general, I think climate disinformation, you know, and, and Jenny, who I'm filling in for today, has, has authored great reports about this, that it seeks to, you know, really close off the options for responding to climate change and slow down responses and reduce the ambition of government policies. I think that's in a broad sense, but to be very specific, uh, the, the Advance Australia campaign that I showed you, Not Zero, that's about connecting in people's mind this 
this association between cost of living rises and emission reduction policy, so action on climate change. And um, in a way, it's it's about scapegoating, you know, climate climate action as the cause of, of kind of current um, cost rises. Um, and you know, what impact does that have? It's not just this example, but that idea has been pushed out very, very strongly in Australia through our through our media and through vested interests um, for a very long time. Um, but we, an interesting thing we did with this campaign. So we saw those examples in the first few days that Advance Australia started advertising them in, I think it was October or November last year. Um, we were doing it in the context of a, a, a um, project around COP27. So we had our campaign team available. And what we did is we um, we wrote them a briefing on, on this campaign and what it meant and the audiences it was targeting, because it's very important to understand who's like Purple's presentation. There is, it's not just one big mass, there's different communities who are thinking about things in different ways. Um, who are the who are advanced trying to speak to? And we then did a counter campaign. Um, so we judged that they were trying to uh, communicate to relatively conservative audiences and trying to kind of build a more strong climate denial position in the Australian Liberal Party. So we ran a counter campaign um, using a kind of an inoculation method, uh, a digital campaign. Um, that was telling people to watch out for this kind of material. That, that there's this kind of it was it was written by actual campaigners with like good good copy, not just like my kind of you know uh, what I'm saying. But the gist of it was that it was telling people you know people are trying to scapegoat climate policy for these cost of living rises, but actually these kinds of policies are the cheapest way to you know solar is the cheapest way to power your house or things like that in Australia. Um, but why I'm giving you that example is because what we got to do on that, that campaign was really interesting is we got to do um, some surveys or kind of testing of the content. And we actually ran a test of Advance Australia's material and our material, and we had a control group and it was it run in an interesting way. But we were looking at how seeing this material shifted people's what, responses to a survey. And what we found that was really on this question of do you think climate policies are to blame for the current cost of living rises, um, we found that if people saw the inoculation material, our material, um, there was a significant shift away from that belief. But I think what's so troubling is that in Australia that we were surveying particularly relatively male, relatively conservative audience, but over 40% of that audience believe that climate change policy was the primary cause of cost of living rises in Australia, which is completely false. And so I think that is the impact, you know, that is just one impact of climate disinformation, that it's shifting people's beliefs and it creates a friendly environment for, for certain policies or a hostile environment for other kinds of policies. It's really about that sort of power. But um, but this stuff is happening, you know, it's on repeat. Advance, like I said, have spent half a million dollars on, on one campaign. They have significant resources. Our campaign, you know, we had a limited budget in a small period of time and could only run it for a little while. But those of us who are fighting climate disinformation, we need more resources uh, and more support to run this stuff long term to counter those impacts, I would say. So that was a bit of a long-winded response, Nicholas. But, um, but yeah, that's a, a few different takes on impact. Thank you. Uh, Purple and uh, Ju, whenever you are ready, just let me know, let us know. Purple? Um, for the impact of um, public perception of this information, uh, the thing is, I think I first need to emphasize that however the public responds to certain examples of uh, disinformation, climate disinformation, um, they are very quite um, massively linked to identity and the ambition for national, national rejuvenation. So the thing is, for example, um, they believe that climate change is real and the, the, the belief that climate change is real, that global warming is real, but it's beneficial to mainland China. It stems from their aspiration for national rejuvenation, meaning that they wanted to you know, be seen again as the great China, like they were seen before, like uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So the, the perception um, is very much connected to that. It's not about just is the climate science real or not. It's like, what does it mean for our ambitions as a nation? 
So mm-hmm. if the message from the top is yes, it's real, but then you have certain people or sectors or part members of the public in mainland China believing that, oh, good, it's real, then it's what our leadership said. But then we also believe that, you know, this is something that's good for us because it may help us be prosperous again. I think it's worth noting that the government actually does something to correct that perception. Okay, so um, so the spread of this information is cut um, by uh, Chinese experts themselves, or members mm-hmm. of the party, even, I will say. So um, the perception, uh, both of the government and the public should be um, the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, we believe that climate science is real, but if we're going to go beyond, something that we're going to correct. Great. Thank you, Purple. June? All right. You, I, I can probably respond in the context yes. of the recommendation. Nicholas, is that, is that helpful? Yes. yes, 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 it is, it is. All right, okay. Let me just... Oh, where did that go? Um, sorry. Was that shared? No. It is shared, and I really like the title that democracy is not what you have, but actually what you do. Oh, okay, all right, you got it. Okay, excellent, yeah. that's great. Okay. Oops. Sorry. Oops. I went back to the beginning. Uh, oops. No. Oh, what can I? What? All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think in the presentation I said about is grasping the Janus face of the crisis, not just about the danger, but the opportunities. And I think with the report, what we want to say is that it's not just about democratic habilitation, but how do you innovate or reinvigorate uh, uh, democracy? And I think what's interesting connecting with the previous questions is that I think people need to believe there's a problem, but they also need to believe that they can actually engage in action to deal with the problem, right? So I'm not an expert in the information, but I'm just talking generally. And it seems to me, when thinking about climate change as a problem, all right, and you know, whole range of organizations said that the role of government, the role of state is absolutely crucial, right? And conversely, if there are basically, you know, it's quite interesting, Luke's example of, um, of um, advance, but also in ways purpose, a counter example of China about the role of the state is perceived quite differently, right? Okay, in those two different perspectives. So what we had in terms of moving forward, it connects to that is really to say, we need the, the state in my mind, um, its role will increase in the climate crisis, whatever it might be, yeah? Think about even, the fact you have clim- regular climate disruptions, whether the floods and so on and so forth, the state will always be called upon to actually deal with those issues. It can't be due- that, dealt with any other institution. But the real question is what kind of state it will be. And here it's really funding that it needs to be a state that can plan to deal with the short-termism, but needs to be a democratic one. So there's actually a number of recommendations there. And key to the democratic part is ensuring that the politics are fair and inclusive. And this really deals with the issue about the capture by vested interests. And you recall that one of the circumstances of democratic debilitation was about self-referring mechanisms. So we're just thinking about me, myself, and I in this particular point of time. And it's really expanding what the talk of you called the spirit of democracy to institutionalize solidarity. And I think what people forget is that in fact, solidarity is in fact a democratic principle. Why is it democratic principle? Simply because democracies are based on communities. Yeah. And communities always have the requirement of mutual aid, which is, of course, solidarity. And then the various other recommendations in terms of invigorated multilateralism and, of course, further research. I've probably spoken too much, so I'll stop the share. Thank you. It was very helpful. Let me now uh, move to the discussion I posted actually. Um, uh, actually, the discussion uh, in in uh, the other end, and uh, I have posted the, the questions to the speakers. How can scientists and researchers, you think, effectively can communicate complex data, in our case, climate data, to the public, on the, and on the same time being able to counter disinformation? Because as you can understand, uh, uh, among the scientists, sometimes there are, let's say, different approaches. These different approaches many times have been exploited from disinformation, let's say, agents 
in order to present that, uh, for example, to speak against climate change. So my question in this case, it is how can scientists and researchers effectively communicate complex climate data to the public while countering this information? I will start with Purple because Purple actually mentioned that topic. It was part of her presentation and especially on how it has been tackled. Purple, thank you. Um, for this one, I think it's more of like, who are the scientists mm -hmm. um, who should communicate? Because if we go back to the books that were published between 2008 and 2011, those books that uh, tried to say that climate change is a myth then created by Western nations. One of the points there is that, you know, all those scientists who were talking about the climate change, about climate change saying it's real, these are all Western scientists. And you totally sideline the scientists and experts coming from mainland China. So that kind of alienation actually sort of also contributed to them being closed off. You know, from being receptive to the fact that climate change is real. So I would say that here, at least in our part of the region, it's important that journalists and you know scientists um, from mainland China are given the chance to talk about climate change because this is how their public, you know, the target uh, market, target listeners would listen. Um, we're talking about old uh, Chinese people, you know, um, and again, it's all interlinked to identity. Why will we listen to Western scientists when we also have scientists here? So it's more like it's, Chinese scientists should be given more um, space and opportunity to say what they know about climate change. Yeah, Thank you. I'm just just because oh, that was a really. Yeah. So nope. I can pick that up. Um, just really agreeing with Purple that what I think is so important is we have more people communicating about climate science, not just climate scientists, but more different kinds of climate scientists in more different places, um, two, two different kinds of audiences as well. I think, you know, it's 2023, like we're into the 2020s. I When I was in primary school in the 1990s, um, we were learning about climate change and we were asking these questions. How can climate scientists communicate better? You know, it, we're now decades on and, um, and you know, there are really good materials out there and courses, you know, there are, there are science communication university courses. Like, I think what's really important to, for us to seriously recognize is that like good communications is not just a checklist or um, a kind of approach. It's a serious profession um, and science organizations in lots of places have hired really great communicators to work with them um, but you know in, in in but in general need to I think really partner with other organizations to do that but I, I guess like what I wanted to to point out with that is that there's no specific checklist for communications because different audiences need to be communicated to in different ways. Um, science, scientists are really good sometimes at communicating to other scientists. And that's really important. Scientists really need to communicate to each other. Um, in Australia, you know, if we're talking about a conservative audience or, you know, a, a particular, say, like Chinese Australian audience or um, or you know all kinds of different audiences. We need experts who are, have experience communicating with those audiences and who are trusted by them to deliver communications. You can't have like you know random white Australian climate scientist trying to tell you know like recent migrant community in Western Sydney what they should be doing. Like they're not a trusted. You know they don't have any any existing relationship or uh, accountability to that audience. Um, people listen to people they have a relationship to and who are accountable to them. Um, I think that's really, really important. And I just think the other other side of this, um, my sister actually runs a great project um, that operates in Western Sydney and talks about climate change impacts, but it talks about extreme heat. And Western Sydney is um, often one of the hottest places on earth. Uh, and it's where a huge portion of the Australian population live. But when people think about climate change in Australia, they often think about sea level rise, but it's all rich people who live on the coast mostly. Um, and there's that concern there, but extreme heat is the actual 
big killer in Australia from climate change. So we, but as Purple said, we need to be hearing from other voices, you know, the actual experience of a you know, 50 degree day in an Australian suburb that, where the library doesn't even have air conditioning, you know, and you have to go to the local you know, gambling centre because they have air conditioning there. Like that's, that's the experiences of climate change I think we need to be hearing from. Um, and yeah, climate scientists and other people who have resources need to be lifting up the voices of more, a bigger range of people, I would say. Thank, thank you, thank you, Luke. June. Oh, look, I'll, I'll pass on this. It's not really my area of expertise, and Luke Purple and uh, Luke have very definitely deal, dealt with the question. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Let's move to the other questions then, uh, posted from uh, the audience. Actually, um, what should be the role of journalists to help people get the right information about about climate change? And there is another one that um, how we can clarify um, uh, that to the people regarding the climate change uh, consequences, etc. And then how can countries in the Pacific that experience the impact of climate change every day can fight this information? Do you think uh, the major contributors to emission are still in denial or it has been improved over time? Each of you, do you want to like choose to which question you want to respond? Because there are Many questions. I would like to thank participants for being a very active and engaging audience. Actually, um, um, if it, if it's okay with Luke and Ju Chong, I would like to take on the question about what should be the role of journalists. I mean, but of yes. course, both of them. Yeah, yes, please do. I said purple. Please, thank you. Uh, but I just wanted to say that the thing is, um, here actually, the fact that you tried to talk to Chinese scientists is already a huge deal. It's a very important undertaking because, um, um. Earlier, I said that it's important that we also try to talk to them and then get their insights. Well, scientists from Western countries, of course, have very significant uh, contributions to the discourse. Um, if we can also talk to them, that will be that will be great and um, um, helpful to the target audience here. But having said that, it's very very tricky to actually access them, and we're very much aware of that uh, difficulty. Like, how do you actually even reach Chinese scientists? So I would say that for journalists, I, um, it would be good if you can find ways to even access them. And there are ways, and some of them will respond. But here in Hong Kong and then mainland China, um, it will be very, again, difficult to do so. But it's not impossible. So I would say try. That would be the best thing that you can do. Try to talk to Chinese scientists to be able to help counter misinformation in China. So yeah, that's that would be my take. Thank you, Purple. Luke or Ju, do you want to take June, please? Oh no, I, I was just going to. That was a great answer by Purple. So and also my area with these, so I'm not going to tread there. So yeah. I can I can pick up um, the the question of of um, the Pacific. I mean, obviously, Pacific nations are some of the most impacted by climate change increasingly. Um, I think what's really and I, you know, and I think there's lots of amazing um, Pacific journalists and and other activists who have done great work on this. Um, I recently a couple of things, just shout outs to things I recently read. One one thing is the uh, Pacific the, the uh, Pacific Journalism Review, which is um, is a is a really accessible um, journal about journalism in the, in Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific. Um, is a really really great resource and has talked a lot about climate change over the years. I would really recommend people look up the Pacific Journalism Review. Um, Another thing I recently read was about the um, anti-nuclear protests throughout the Pacific through the 20th century as a really important historical example of solidarity between um, different nations and different kinds of nations supporting and different kinds of organizations supporting in different ways. Um, I think from, you know, from my perspective as, as a person in Australia, I would say 
um, reaching out to to aligned you know people in Australia, different kinds of organizations, including you know me. If, if there are people in the Pacific working on this stuff, I'd love to to connect with you. Um, and you can email me. It's just luke.bacon@purpose.com. Um, but yeah, I think connecting with each other because Australia, you know, Australia is a rich country that is historically one of the biggest you know, per capita emitters of carbon em emissions. Like Australia is a very, it needs to take responsibility and I think should be providing more funding both um, to, you know, to journalists and different kinds of institutions throughout the Pacific, um, but also to help mitigate climate impacts as well. So I'd say um, on that front. And then, uh, yeah, the other, just on the journalism question more broadly, um, we're working with a great um, environmental journalist in Brazil at the moment, um, Dennis Barbosa, and he was saying to me, um, environmental journalism is used to be seen as a kind of weird niche, but it's increasingly seen as like just so relevant to every single type of, of journalism, you know, whether it's the economy or politics or business, there's a climate angle. Um, I know he's you know, very experienced, but that real kind of specialized specialization for journalists to really learn about the environment, learn a bit about science, learn about how to assess something's credibility, um, take that really seriously. I think there's a lot of good resources out there um, and good examples for journalists. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. I have uh, posted here that um, uh, regarding that uh, regarding this discussion as well as your contribution. Uh, I would like just to take a final note from every speaker in order, since we are uh, actually reaching uh, the time limit that we have set for this webinar. I will start from Ju and then move to Purple and then to Lucas. Ju, your final comment. Oh, look, I'll just be brief, really, to thank you, uh, Nicholas, for such excellent moderating. And, you know, I've, I've learned so much hearing from Purple and Luke and the questions in the, um, the chat. So thanks. Thanks, everybody. And please feel free to contact me if um, you know you know continue the conversations. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, I just it's it's so nice to connect with people, particularly across um, the Asia Pacific, around this issue. I mean, I think everyone said the key thing is more voices, more working together, more collaboration, and it's you know, through more events like this and and the the symposium or the big conference in Sydney that you're hosting, Nicholas and um, Mar Mariana. So. It's really a, yeah, an honor to be here talking with you all. And I think this is, this is the way we work through it. Thank you, Luke. The honor is ours uh, as well. Purple? Um, is it okay if I answer first a question from one of the participants? Okay, so what do you think of China's top down commitment? Well, the structure is, you know, governance structure in mainland China is that it's very, very top down. So when Xi Jinping actually said that, made that announcement um it sort of gave the policy direction and already um provided the energy uh the to other stakeholders and actors so in a way uh because of the structure again of the governance in mainland china it jolted everyone else into action which is i suppose you know good in terms of climate action but i don't know if you're trying to also say that within the context of is is it also like um exclusionary because it's very top down doesn't include let's say like you know it's not coming from the public um again in the context of how china works um there it came from the leadership and what the leadership says is what will the other actors follow and do eventually so it has its um definitely pros and cons uh, but in terms of you know the global uh, context, it was important that China made that commitment, I would say, especially because we all know it's a top emitter. So I hope that answers um, your question. And then yes. I would just like to thank um, again, Chu Chung and Luke and Nicholas and Mariana. I learned a lot. I want to know more about the gamers, actually, if I had the chance. And I want to know about, aside from short-termism, that capture vested interest, like I want to know more. So thanks for this opportunity to be part of this wonderful discussion. Thank you. I would like to thank you all, uh, both the, our distinguished speakers that they actually shared with their vision, their research, and actually their recommendations, and their actually time with us in order to, to have this 
great discussion. Uh, I would also like to thank Mariana for actually organizing this event that it has proven to be uh, a very useful event that we will continue and build up on it as we have uh, discussed. Uh, please uh, join us in uh, the hybrid uh, event uh, that we will inaugural event that we will organize in Sydney in Australia between 16 to 18th of October. It is uh, actually it will be continuous of this discussion. You can actually find all the relevant information here, and you can join us uh, virtually in order to follow up this type and this very qualitative uh, kind of discussions uh, and with insightful comments as well as with uh, very impressive technological advancements uh, where the participant will uh, have the chance to witness uh, a metaverse experience. DCN, uh, this event has been organized by DCN Global and supported actually from uh, World Learning, uh, as well as um, Educational Exchanges Office of uh, State Department in, uh, in order actually to, to emphasize on uh, a very important element and issue such as climate change and disinformation. Thank you all and hope to see you in uh, one of our next events and most importantly in the one in Australia. Have a nice day wherever you are. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye.